Y'all please take a seat. Well, again, y'all welcome to the Springs. If you've been with us the past couple weeks, one of the things that you'll know is that we are right now working our way through a series. This is our last week in the series. It's been a short one called Sweeter Than Honey. Week one, which was two weeks ago, we actually stopped and we looked at why scriptures are called to love scripture. What are the blessings? What are the benefits? What's the gift to you and to me, the why behind it? Last week, my buddy Todd Smith, he came and he talked about, can you trust God's word? That was the first lie that was ever given to mankind, a twisting of God's truth. And since then, man, it's at the root of everything we work through in life. Can you really trust his word? And he presented to you guys, and I took two and a half pages of notes on how, yes, we absolutely can. That this book is true, and it is right, and it is good that we come and we talk about it. And today, we're going to finish now. We're just talking through, okay, well, how? If scripture is sweeter than honey, we'll look at how do you taste the honey. But before we do that, I want to catch you guys up to speed. Me and my wife, we recently, we worked through a pretty big purchasing decision in our household, right? So we, like a lot of people, summertime comes, we're newer to New Braunfels, so we're getting used to everything. And we moved from Dallas, so not that far away. But y'all, there's a noticeable heat difference between even Dallas and New Braunfels. And it's one of those, you come here, you get out on a Sunday, you finish service, you get out there. Man, it is blisteringly hot here. Now, for those of you that are from like deep West Texas, besides the humidity, I bet you're like, this is nothing, right? But all that to say is for us, it's been tough. So this purchasing decision has been around something I have wanted for a long time, right? Y'all know where I'm going with this? I'm talking about a pool, y'all. Yeah. So I've wanted a pool for a long time. So for those of you who live here, a pool, one, it's expensive, takes maintenance. Man, that's upkeep. You got to look after that for a long time. The area of town we live in, it's like notorious for six inches under the dirt. There's just a ton of rock. So to dig a pool out, they got to first like jackhammer all this rock out. I think you end up with some cool stones here and there because of it. But basically it costs a whole lot more. It'll take time. It's the examination of debt. What do you do? Well, man, my parents came in two weeks ago. I was hanging out with them. We are sitting out we got a one and a half year old daughter in her tiny little blue pool. Tiny little one, like the one you buy at HEB that's like this deep. And I'm not kidding you, I'm sitting in it with my one and a half year old and my mom. Yeah, yeah, there's a photo, but I was too embarrassed. Right, so I'm sitting in that and all of a sudden I realized, that's it, we're getting the pool. So I talked to my wife, ran it by council, all that kind of stuff. And I'll tell you what, y'all, we bought a pool. Check this out. I don't see what's so funny. I get that reaction consistently. That is right there, our family resort. We actually call it the Omquist Last Resort, right? That has been us. If you don't know what that is, that is a stock tank. What's a stock tank? It's a tool used to feed animals out in the middle of the pasture. Where did I buy it? From Alan at New Braunfels Feed and Store. Phenomenal customer service, plug to Alan, right? Literally, I called him after sitting there looking at my daughter in this pool. I said, hey, sweetheart, if I use my Christmas and birthday money, can I go get an adult version of this? She looks at me kind of funny. Seriously, I pick up the phone, I call him. He has it there waiting. We throw it on a flatbed truck. We bring it back. Man, I tell you what, we've already had a ton of fun hanging out in that pool. You might be wondering, well, where's all the water come from? What do you do? Well, hey, we have a hose. It works phenomenally well, and that's what we use it for. My mom, when she was in town though, because she's from Georgia, she looked at me as I was going to do this and she said, John, you have Schlitterbahn here. Why would you ever buy a glorified dunking tank? Right, why would you do that? Just go to that, right? You and Taylor can do it. You can take your daughter Lily. You can have a ton of fun. And man, I can remember, I didn't even think about Schlitterbahn. Didn't even think about it. This, I wanted this far more than I wanted Schlitterbahn. <laughs> oh yeah, there it is, man. Right? So check, check that out. Just imagine if, though, I I've, I've still have yet to go to Schlitterbahn. I still have yet to go. But I'm sure many of you, you guys may have been. If not, we'll go do a fun Schlitterbahn hangout sometime. But imagine if I had my pool, and I will call it a pool, right? I had my pool, and then one of you guys said, hey, man, you want to come? Me and the family, we're going to go to Schlitterbahn. We'd love for you guys to come hang out with us, right? And my response was, no, man, I got a pool. I don't, I don't really need Schlitterbahn. I got a pool. 
you would look at me and you'd be kind. You'd be like, no, 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 no. But it's, it's Schlitterbahn. I know you're new to town. I don't know if you know this, but it's like the number one world park or water park in the world. And I'd sit there and be like, I know, but have you seen my last resort? <laughs> right? Yeah. We debated on showing y'all this because it may be inappropriate. And I was like, well, it's because I show off my abs. And one guy was like, it's more like an ab. And I was like, that's hurtful, buddy. That's hurtful. So all that to say is welcome to the Springs, y'all. Uh, but really, so we thought about, okay, so you come and you invite me to Schlitterbahn. And you say, hey, you got to come with me and my family. I say, no, no, I'm good. And you say, no, no, there's so much more at Schlitterbahn than your pool. And it's laughable to call it a pool, right? You could look at me and you can take it a couple different ways. You could look at me and you say, hey, John, John, have you thought about this? Schlitterbahn, it's got funnel cakes. It's got snow cones. You want to come now? My wife, she eats real healthy. I'm working on it, right? And my, my response could be, well, hey, I can walk about 30 feet and have multiple options for organic vegetables. I'm good. Right? Not the same. Not the same. You could come and you could say things like, hey, John, but there's slides. You don't get it. You could put Lily, that's my daughter, in a little tube, go down all these slides. You could have a blast. There's a wave pool. There's even lazy river if you just want to chill and go around. And what if my response is, well, hey, I don't know if you know this. My pool, it's galvanized steel. So what that means is when you step in it, that base, it's kind of slippery. <laughs> right? So you get it in there and immediately you kind of slip down. It's very exciting. It's just like a Schlitterbahn ride. It's the same thing. I don't need that better experience. I don't need the depth of a greater water park. And then you look at me and you're like, okay, all right, if this won't work for you, let me appeal to Lily. John, there's water playgrounds everywhere. You got water cannons. You can squirt each other. You can get after it. You can have a blast. And I look at you and I'm like, hey, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but I have a phenomenal garden hose. Phenomenal. And if I even duct tape it, which I did. If I duct tape it up against the side of it, it squirts in like a water feature, right? You can go have your wave pool. I've got my water feature, right? One, it would be funny. Sure, we, we joke about it, but that would be ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Why? Because there's something so much greater and all you're trying to get me to do is to go check it out. All you're trying to get me to do is go experience it. Here's the reason I share that, right? When it comes to God's word, when it comes to we being Christians, far too many of us, here's what we do. We settle with a my size pool, view of his word, view of scripture, the depth of relationship where you can get to know a God who loves you. When the whole time God in heaven, he appeals to you and he appeals to me. He's like, no, 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 I've got Schlitterbahn. Stop sitting in your silly tub, man. I've got Schlitterbahn. Get to know me. You want to have life, joy, and abundance? Get out of the hose and come to the wave pool. That is where I've made you to delight. What we want to talk about today is how do we go from a view of God's word, from a love of God's word, that's about the figurative size of my eight by two by two stock tank all the way to the world's greatest water park. How do you and how do I, how do we learn to love God's word in a way? It transforms us to where we really are different people. We don't just come and give it lip service. We don't just rely on everything we learned in Sunday school, perhaps growing up and use that today, but no. We feast on what God has provided. Then here's why I think this matters, especially right now. Here's why I think this matters. If you're hearing your follower Jesus Christ, you may have heard this said before. One in a hundred people will read a Bible, right? I don't know if that's actually accurate, but pick some number. Not many people will read a Bible, but you know what many people read? Is they'll read you. And your life is called to reflect the love of a God that makes himself very well known through this. They may not read the word, but they will see the living and active word in you. So church, I got to ask us, how are we doing? Like, has this been something we, we've met with, we've asked God to reveal himself, we've studied, we've learned, we've prayed, we've read? Or is this as it was for me for so long? Man, I know which shelf it's on, and I know I can pick it up and read it, but usually it's boring, it seems irrelevant, it doesn't seem to apply to my life, and I just can't understand it. 
We must be people of the word. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, if you're here and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, right, you're here and that's not for you. Two weeks ago, we talked about, here's why I think this still applies and matters for you. I did my best to build a case of, as you look out throughout civilization, especially Western civilization, there is no text, no piece of literature that has done more to shape it than scripture, none. And because of that, having a cultural understanding, man, you gotta at least check it out. Here's the reason I think why it matters today. A lot of times, and if you're a person who, uh, out of a love, and may we all be this if we're Christians, where we go and we get the joy from, hey, I'd love to share with you the hope I have. Where we get to engage, we get to evangelize, we get to talk to people about Jesus. One of the questions that oftentimes will come back is, hey, I can't believe that. Well, why not? Because man, I can't trust anything that book says. It's corrupted, it's broken. And that's where Todd last week, he gave some great thoughts behind. Here's why you can trust it. Right, but besides that, one of the things I love doing in that moment, because it's usually people beginning to show you the real heart of it like their view towards it and their heart in it, is you ask the question, say, hey, it sounds like then you've spent some time. May I ask you, what do you think the summary theme of the Bible is? Like if I asked you right now, if you had one sentence, you could just give me one sentence. What do you think the summary theme of the Bible is? I have yet to find somebody who can come back and rightly respond with, hey, here's what it is. It's a loving God in pursuit of a defying people. And he will go to any length to redeem them and call them home. But if you deny him, he will allow the denial. I've never heard that. I've, never heard that. I've heard a bunch of things of, that, are, that are misplaced in, in kind of caricatures of the faith. So here's what I'm saying. If you're here and you're not a Christian, if you're here and your parents dragged you, you're a student in high school, you're in college, you're a young adult, you're married, you've got grandkids, wherever you are, if you want to reject it, which you're, you can do, if you want to reject it, I'm just asking you, as with all things, at least understand it. That's why this matters. That's why today we're going to talk about in the series, Sweeter Than Honey, how do you learn to love honey? Right? It just comes alive to the mouth even if you put honey in it. But man, as we look at God's word, as we come to feast, how do you do it? How do you do it? Today's going to be a little different, though. Usually what you do when you come to, the, come to the springs, we'll find a text and we'll kind of teach through it. Today, we're just gonna jump around. Specifically, two different sections, right? But we're gonna go to a bunch of different topics. A lot of times when you come on a Sunday, it would be more, and there's a term called exposition. Today, I just call it, it's gonna be equipping. So welcome to the Springs Bible 101 training class. My goal for this class time today is for you to go home and for you to fight the urge that I have to fight daily of, man, I don't really need to read it. I don't really need to spend time. It won't really help me. And instead, connect with a God who stirs up, who generates within you steadfastness. That's the goal. We're going to look at two ideas. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about how do we learn to love the story. When I say story, what I'll mean by that is the context, the overarching view of Scripture. After that, we'll talk about how do we learn to love the text. The first place we'll be is Psalm 119. So if you got a phone, you can click that. Or if you got a Bible, you can turn there, Psalm 119. If you don't know where that is, open your Bible about to the middle. You'll likely land in Psalms and then just go to 119. We read before, right at the beginning of the service, verses 9 through 16. Uh, I'm just going to highlight 15 and 16. But really, I'm just going to use that as a launch pad to get into the topic. The second text we're going to look at, it's going to be out of Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. So while you're turning to Psalm 119... This is, the authorship of who wrote it, it's unknown. It is the longest chapter in your Bible. Its purpose is to elevate a love of God's word. The author, he writes this while he's under some type of duress, difficulty. And in the difficulty, he is reaching out and he's clinging to what God has said to be true about him, about his world, and about others, and how he relates and interacts. That's the context for this. The part before, this whole theme that we read right at the start, it's really this idea of rejoicing at the thought of how do I take God's word and put it internal? It's internalizing it. And at the end of it, he gives this declaration, which is what our declaration is today. Right here, verses 15 and 16. I will meditate on your precepts 
and fix my eyes on your ways. And fix my eyes, there's another implied I will. So I'm gonna read that again with the implied I will. I will meditate on your precepts and I will fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. So the first idea I wanna talk about today, the first idea is how do we learn to love the story? How do we learn to love the story? If I were to ask you, what is the most important page in your Bible? You don't have to yell it out, but how would you answer that, right? You, you can think about that. It feels like a trick question. I guess it sort of is, right? Because everyone always thinks, well, just say Jesus, John three sixteen, something like that, right? Uh, I, I would say, I'd argue, your table of contents. Table of contents. So if you have a literal Bible, turn to your table of contents with me. That's where we're going. If you don't, look at the drop-down menu that you can look at, Old Testament to New Testament, all that kind of stuff. My prayer is through this, whether on a phone or with a Bible, the table of contents becomes a page that is so marked up in your Bible. Why? Because this holds the key to the story, the meta narrative, the big summary theme, the 30,000 foot view that runs through scripture. A lot of times when people talk about their Bible, they talk about a book. They talk about a book, which is true, which you said that is true. But really the way I'm asking you to think about your Bible is think about it like a library, right? It's like a library where one theme runs through every book. Okay, there's 66 books. Your Old Testament has 39. Your New Testament has 27. It's written by 40 plus authors in three different languages. It covers a time span of more than 2,000 years years. It was written across three different continents. And you know what? It has one divine author and one truth to it all. So what we want to do is, again, we're, our, our goal is to understand the story. Specifically, we'll jump into Old Testament and then we'll go new. So I want to show you this next slide and start thinking with me about the Old Testament. Now this slide, when, you, when you're preaching, here's what the rule that this slide totally breaks. You're never supposed to put that much content on a slide, <laughs> ever, because there's no way people are going to get it all, right? Here's what this is, and we will find a way to publish this. I don't think we have a blog, but we will create a blog just to put this and then a New Testament one out there, because here's what I want. This is at least a fundamental, a basic understanding for what is the overarching theme? What is the story, the context of your Old Testament? Because here's what I, I want to do. If you're sitting here and you're thinking through, hey, I want to read my Bible. Here's what I would never recommend. You ever done this? You just take it, you open, you start flipping. You're like, all right, God, where do you want me to? Okay. And you just start reading. Because here's why. Every text is inside of a bigger picture. And this shows us the bigger picture here. Let, let me show you what I mean, even with the Old Testament. Right, the Old Testament, there's 39 books. The way you remember that, Old has three letters, Testament has nine letters. Right? It's broken out into three different genres, three different types of literature. Historical, poetical, I'm blanking on the other, prophetical. Yeah, I should know that, right? Prophetical, historical, a lot of that tells the narrative, the history, the theme of the nation of Israel. So the book of Genesis, that's where you start. That's the, in the beginning. You begin with there's this cosmic realm and it invades a human realm. God goes and he creates mankind. He creates the world. He creates animals. He creates the fish. He creates the birds. He creates you and me. You and me though. You know what we do? Even though God loves us, he pursues us, he cares for us, we choose to rebel. And in that rebellion, we call that the fall where sin enters. Here's what happens. The fall, brokenness of sin, it so permeates humanity. You fast forward just to Genesis 6, and all of humanity defies God, doesn't want him. God loves them, and he calls them, and they say, I don't want you. Their hearts were continuously prone to evil. And so God sent a flood, and he judged the earth. And the only family that was delivered was through a righteous man, Noah, and his family. God comes, he delivers them through the flood. And God says, again, follow, I love you. Let me set you up for this. And the people again continue. And their hearts go to defy God to where they even build this tower. And in this tower, they, they're essentially looking to God and saying, I don't need you. And God this time, instead of judgment, he forces obedience. Like they were refusing to do what God had commanded. 
So God, he confuses their language. It's a story called Babel. You don't have to worry about it, right? But from that, that's how every person on the earth, that's the origin story. But the book of Genesis, it shifts. And it starts to talk about a nation being born. Where God comes to, you guys heard of Father Abraham and many sons? Yeah, y'all get what I'm talking about. Those y'all who grew in church, right? So it starts talking about Abraham. And Abraham becomes the father of the Jewish faith, the predecessor of the Christ to come. And God says, hey, through you, I will bring a blessing to the people. Abraham, Isaac is his son. Jacob was his son. And then we get to Joseph, Abraham's great grandson, Joseph. He has this position with a family where his brothers are jealous. His brother's taken, they throw him in a pit. They sell him into slavery. The slaves take him, they sell him to a Potiphar. The Potiphar, he does well. The Potiphar, it's just this position, this government official. His wife accuses Joseph of rape takes him, throws him in a prison. This is a man who'd been faithful to God. Throws him in a prison. All of a sudden, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, hears Joseph's in prison, learns of some of Joseph's gifts and his talents and his abilities of administration, leadership, and ability to interpret dreams. He says, hey, bring him. Joseph shows himself faithful to where all of a sudden, this people of God, this nation that was about 70 folks, comes and they're in the land of Egypt. Here's why this matters. That's the context of Genesis. If you just turn to a random chapter in Genesis, you gotta know the big story. How, how did we get to the Exodus? How did we get to Moses? Joseph comes into Egypt. All of a sudden, 400 years go by and the Pharaoh forgets the faithfulness of Joseph. See, all this, you don't have to remember all this, guys. But what I'm praying you know, what I'm praying you grasp is every story is part of a bigger story. So God is trying to demonstrate himself as the one true God, Yahweh in Pharaoh, the leader of Egypt. His heart is hardened against God. He sets tasks on the Israelites, the people of God. And so what does God do? God raises up a deliverer, his name's Moses. Moses comes and he leads his people out after a whole bunch of plagues. It was really exciting, you should read it. Start of Exodus. And he takes them through the Red Sea in a miraculous moment all the way to a mountain called Sinai. At Sinai, they receive the law of God. They receive it. Their heart first is excited. And then what do they do? They reject it. They start to build idols after they just watched God deliver them from the world's greatest superpower with miraculous plagues, parting a sea, carrying them through, bringing water, sending food. Why does that matter? You ever not obey God even after he's just shown himself to be great in your life? Story matters. Story matters. God takes that people under the leadership of Moses and he brings them to a promised land. And he says, this is the land that I have for you. I have for you. Go spy it out. They send 12 spies. 10 of them, 10 of them didn't trust that God would take care of it. 10 of them didn't believe that God would lead them into it. And so God says, okay, if you don't trust me, take a walk. They wandered the desert for 40 years, all until a new leader arises by the name of Joseph, Joshua. He leads them into the promised land. That's Genesis, Exodus, Numbers. Leviticus is a holiness code that happens. Deuteronomy is a retelling. Here's why this matters. You don't have to know all this stuff now, but when you go to open your Bible, you wanna learn that it's sweeter than honey? You gotta fight to learn the bigger story. We could keep going here. Uh, Joshua goes into the promised land, he conquers, but he doesn't devote everything the way that God would have had him. So he essentially, he doesn't eliminate all the sin and that remnant of sin in the book of Judges. You see it grow and it leads the people to depravity where there's seven cycles of God trying to save them, them rebelling all the way until the end of the book of Judges. They say, I don't need God, I need a king. And God says, no, you need me. And they say, I'll take the king. And he says, okay, your will be done. Send him Saul. Saul, he ends up, he fears people more than he fears God. So who comes next? David. David, he's a man after God's own heart. This is David and Goliath. He continues on, but even he has got some black marks on his life in the same way I've got on mine. Right from David comes Solomon. Solomon was the richest, the wisest man. We're in 2 Samuel now, the richest and the wisest man to have ever lived. Do you know what happened to him? He punted on his faith at the end of his life. That's right there, right now about 2 Samuel. No, 1 Kings 12, sorry. We're in 1 Kings right now. All of a sudden, Solomon has a son, Rehoboam. He, he takes over, he's king of the nation of Israel. The people come and they say, hey man, I need you to help us. Take some of the burdens your dad gave us. And his leadership decision was, no, nah, no, nah, you thought my dad was bad? You wait till me and he makes it worse. What does that do? It splits the nation in half. All of a sudden you have a northern Israel. There's civil war in your Old Testament. Do you know this? Because it matters, especially when you pick up the prophets. 
right? Who are they speaking to? Why are they speaking to it? There's a God throughout the Old Testament that runs towards a humanity. And that humanity defies, rebels, says, I don't need you. Church, we got to know the story. That's your old. Let's check out the new. All right, for time's sake, I'm, gonna walk, I'm not going to walk through the first half of this one, right? But your New Testament, it builds the same way. If your Old Testament covers a span of more than 2,000 years, your New Testament covers about 100 where it starts out with four biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic. Synoptic means they see through one lens. They have a theme. There's a common structure. It's chronological. The book of John, he doesn't follow chronology. He wrote it just to convert people. If you're wondering which book you should start reading in, if you've been away from scripture for a while, don't go to Genesis. Start in John and turn right following the life of Christ. You have the book of Acts, which is just the acts of his people on behalf of his spirit. It starts with the establishment of the church. And then you see its expansion through mission. And they just go on this tremendous church planning campaign, loving and hosting the people. And then all the letters of the New Testament, that's all an epistle is. It's just a letter, are written to strengthen individuals or churches. And it ends in a book, a book of prophecy where God demonstrates, hey, here's how one day, even though these people from start, from this side, all the way to this side, they've run, they've defied, they have not trusted, they have not listened, even though I've sought to love them, even though I sent my son to die for them, they've run. At the end of it, he says, I'm still coming for you. And those of you who believe, you will spend eternity with me in heaven. But all of you, whether you believe or not, Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. And there will one day be a moment of judgment. And I mean that both. Joyous occasion for those who trusted in him. And for those who haven't, here's what you gotta hear. God loves you so much. If you don't wanna believe in God, guess what he won't do? He won't force you to trust in, to like him, to love him, to care for him in eternity. If you don't wanna be around him here, He will honor your wishes there. But what has he done? He's left us a story. And there's a context to the story. So as you examine the 66 books, here's what you gotta do. If you wanna learn to see this as sweeter than honey, you gotta learn the context. You gotta learn the context. We'll talk about how at the end. Next passage I wanna go to. Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews chapter four. We're just gonna read verse 12, and then we're gonna come back and talk through it. This will be my second point. For the word of God, it is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Did y'all read that? Did y'all hear what that really said? Here's what it didn't say. Here's what it didn't say. For the word of God is dying and dull. It's more ineffective than a two-edged sword. It goes to penetrate you, but it can't because it has no power all the way down to the division of your soul and your spirit, the joints and of the marrow. It actually confuses your thoughts and doesn't help you think through them. And it does not help you understand your emotions in any way. I talk to people all the time who probably own 10 of these, yet that's how they feel. So how do we turn the corner? How do we come to say, okay, there's context, there's a bigger story. I wanna learn the grand narrative of God's rescue mission for me. But then how do we learn the text? My second point is we gotta learn to love the text. Here's the questions I wanna answer for you. How do you have a quiet time? What is a quiet time? Or how do you read your Bible to where once you read it, you don't just walk away and forget everything? And how, when you read your Bible, do you not just want to fall over and fall asleep on top of it? That ever happened to anybody else? You guys are so holy. Y'all should come teach this. Uh, No, hey, the answer is yes. That happens to y'all too, right? So I want to give you five words, five words that really help me. They're all going to start with R. Why? Because it'll help you remember them. And I just like alliteration, okay? The first one, request. We'll talk about what I mean there. Request, review, read, reflect, 
Oh, come on. Repeat. Yeah, that's a good one. Trust me, stay tuned. Right, the first one, request. Man, the first thing I'd do if I was you and you wanna learn to love a Bible. Right, first thing you gotta do is you gotta ask a father in heaven, hey God, would you help me to get to know you? Would you use this prayer? I say this all the time. God, I'm at your word. I don't want to read this. I can think about all the other things I need to be doing, but would you help me to take something from this? Would you help remind me that when I set my heart on you, that is the best. Psalm 119, the guy who wrote all about the Bible, the love of the Bible, you know what he says? Open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous things out of your law. Ask your Father in heaven to help you request it, and he wants to. Second one, review. Review, here's what I mean by that. It's that bigger story component. We call it the context. Easy ways to think about context. Who, what, when, where, why. Right, as we see in the book of Hebrews right here, even Hebrews 4, verse 11, who, who's he writing to? The author's unknown, but he's writing to a group of Jews who converted to Christianity, but were being persecuted for their faith. And because of that, they're thinking about going back. Why? Just make life easier. And so he's writing to them. The context more specifically, he's telling them of the supremacy of Jesus, how Jesus is better than anything. And in this chapter, what he's talking about, how Christianity offers a rest, a salvation rest, and a life rest of Sabbath. So that's your, that's your context, the who, the what's he talking about, the why's he talking about it, the when is he talking about it, people kind of, the timelines in scripture, there's more freedom and lax because that's a little harder to figure out at times. But the when, the where, who's he writing to, you got to review, you got to know the context. So you ask God, you remind yourself, okay, I read this yesterday. Here's what this said. Here's my context. Okay, let's get going. And then read. Here's why I love this. Here's why far too many people just don't sit down to read. You want to learn to love your Bible, just open it up. God loves you. He'll get to know you. It'll work out. If you have his spirit, he says he'll teach you. You read. Sometimes people ask me, well, which Bible do I read? Which version? Here's the answer to that question. You buy whichever Bible version you'll actually read, right? So there's kind of a, a spectrum where the Bible's been translated word for word all the way down to thought for thought. If you're looking to study your Bible well, right? I would go with either NASB, New American Standard, or ESV, which is what I read here. If you're just looking to learn to feast on scripture, man, I'm a huge fan of an NIV Bible, New International Version, or NLT, New Living. God led me to Christ through an NLT Bible, right? Now, here's what you got to know. You always want to read and study in the context of community. Don't go it alone. I also highly recommend a study Bible because what study Bibles have is at the beginning of every book of the Bible, they have a thoughtful group of scholarship that have answered the who, what, when, where, why, how. They bless me when I go to read and I have questions and I say, this doesn't seem to make sense. And I can look at the notes right below. God never wants you to gloss over the things that are confusing. My daughter, Lily, is I going to talk to her? Man, if she's ever confused, I will want to clarify that. God always wants to clarify. You never do it alone. Invite people into that. If you have questions about which study Bibles, man, come find this. We'll get you set up with everything you need. So you request help from God. You review that context, that bigger story, and then you just read. How much time do you read? Man, I'd really encourage you set the goal for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, right? That's a hard goal for a lot of people, and I understand that. But man, when you set it high, you land well. So you set that for that time. Read for 20. Read a chapter a day. Our community group right now, we're working through one chapter a day of the book of Exodus. Depending on the length of the chapter, that can take you everywhere from five minutes to 15. Man, it'll be worth it. You read. And then you get to reflect. Y'all, this is a sweet sauce. This is what makes it special. Right here, the idea of reflecting. Okay. I want to break this out. We actually got another slide into four categories. Four categories. And if this feels right now like, okay, I've got request, I've got review, I've got read, now I've got reflect, and it feels mechanical, stay with me. Stay with me. 
the first thing you want to do is let's just say you're in my community group and you want to read a book or a chapter of Exodus. Here's what I tell you to do. Read a chapter and then think through what stood out. For some of you, that could be a theme or an idea, or for some of you, it could just be a verse in a text. And then with a piece of paper to the side, you just answer four questions. First one, observation. What is the text saying? What is the text saying? So in Exodus chapter three, don't, don't turn there. God's coming to Moses and he's appealing to Moses to come lead his people out. And Moses is a leader, he's nervous. He's hesitant and he gives God all these reasons, all these excuses. So what is that text saying? God's calling Moses to lead his people. What, the next question then, interpretation. What does that mean? What does it mean that God has come to help his people in a time of need? What does that mean to me, interpretation? God helps me in my time of need. Final one, application. What does it mean for me today? You ever have moments where you feel like God has called you to a task, God has given you something, but you're hesitant, you're nervous, or you're scared to go do it, to follow through? What if you won't really show up? Can you tell him that? Moses does, so I think that could apply to me. I can share my thoughts and my feelings with God. And then what does Moses do? By faith, he goes. And man, he still has trouble. But man, he goes. So today, what's my thought today? All right, God, I will trust you and I will go because you're sending me. That's it. A lot of times people will think you have to have a spiritual gift or a unique ability to read scripture and interpret it and understand it. Here's what I would say. I do think for some folks it can come a little easier. I do. But I think the primary means God wants you to get to know him is through his word. And he loves you so much like any daddy to a son that as you read this, you will get to know your father. He will meet with you. So you reflect on the text. Does that make sense? Observation, interpretation, application. You think through it. Picture it's almost like you, you prepare for yourself. My wife loves bubble baths, by the way, right? I think I've said that here a couple times. She loves that. All this is it is a weird biblical way to almost view scripture as, okay, I'm just gonna go soak. I'm gonna take 30 minutes. I don't have to come up with something amazing. I do not need an emotional upheaval every time I read my Bible. Far often that does not happen for me. But I need to remind myself of what is true. And then the last one, meditation. What's the idea that I then cling to and think through throughout the rest of the day? For me, I set alarms. I set alarms throughout my day. Why? Because I'm so forgetful. What do those alarms remind me to do? To pray and to reflect on what I read. I don't, I don't do that for what I come and prepare on a Sunday. I do that because as a follower of Jesus Christ, I need help. You meditate. So we've walked ourselves through request, ask God for help. Review, understand that bigger storyline. You learn to love the narrative of there's a rescuer that has come for you and he's come for me. And then you read it. You show up and you read it with a cup of coffee. For some of you, it's probably early in the morning because you gotta beat the kids. Maybe it's late at night. It's at work, it's at time, but you gotta make a time. You read it and then you reflect. What did this text say? What does that mean? What does that mean to me? And how do I reflect on that throughout the day without never losing the caveat of you take those reflections to your community group if you're in one here at the Springs and you say, hey, here's what God taught me. Because one of the most dangerous things someone can do is learn Bible in isolation. Y'all hear that? A terrifying thing is someone alone with the Bible left to come up with their own thoughts and opinions and decisions. You study this in a group of others who've loved God and have studied it too. Final thing, repeat. I think that one's personally brilliant. Here's why. Because you'll do it a couple times and you'll forget or you'll start like the start of a new year and you'll dive into it and then you'll, you'll quit by J January 17th. Here's the whole thing. Forget guilt and shame. If you've forgotten this for decades, that is fine. But just try again the next day. And if you don't, 
tell yourself this, his mercies are new every morning. Try again the day after that. Ask for help, hey group, how can we? Hey spouse, how can we? Hey children, how can we? Because here's what I'm telling you. If you want your kids to be directed with a love of scripture, if you don't have it, you're trying to give away something you don't have. And man, there's no greater gift you can give your kids outside of a love for Jesus Christ, which come through God, but a love of his word. Knowing it's sweeter than honey, knowing they are not left to themselves to figure it out. This whole idea reminds me of when I tried to learn to play golf. I tried to learn to play golf. I was in eighth grade. Anybody ever play on like a golf team or pretty good at golf? Okay, all right. You're either very humble or asleep. That works for me. Um, all I have to say is I'm not very good at golf. The eighth grade year, I went out, I joined the team. I remember stepping up to the tee box and I hit it and it literally rolled like two feet. It was embarrassing. All these people started making fun of me, all that kind of stuff. Traumatic moment. Here's what I signed up for though, golf lessons. Golf lessons. My mom, she was kind enough. She set me up with that. I began to learn a golf swing. And if you actually play golf, you know this far better than me. It's really mechanical. It's very structured. There's parts to it. There's how you line up at the ball. There's depending on which club you're using, where you set the ball in your stance. There's then the bending. There's this weird grip that took me a while to get used to. There's then the knowledge. You don't just twist like this. First thing to come up are the arms. And the arms need to hit at a 90 degree angle. And from the 90 degree angle, what happens then? You come to the back swing. Right here, the power doesn't come through the hips. If I'm saying this wrong, you're good at golf. Just go with it, right? Power doesn't really come through the hips. The power starts in the shoulders. It's the downswing. The, the arms lead and then the hips follow. The head stays down, all of a sudden, ball launched. Here's what I'm telling you. Every phenomenal golfer, when they step up and they just hit and they swing, there was a time where it felt mechanical. There was a time where they had to think through, okay, line up, ball position, set up, hips, back swing, here, pull down, twist through, head down. They start that way. It always feels mechanical when it's new. But here's what I'm telling you. You watch them do it over time. Man, watching a good golf shot, that's fun. You hear that perfect sound? Here's why I share that. It'll start and it'll feel mechanical. It'll feel rigid, but over time, it will be fluid. I don't think through five R's every time I read my Bible. I open up my Bible and I say, God, help me. And I eat and I feast with what he's provided. But you gotta get through the mechanical to where it's natural. You gotta learn to love the text. So to recap y'all, you gotta learn to love the story. You gotta learn to love the story. You gotta learn to love the text specifically. You gotta request help from God. You gotta review the context of it, that bigger story. You gotta read it, you have to reflect on it. What does it say? What does it mean? What does it mean to me? How do I think on this throughout the day? And you gotta repeat. You gotta keep going. You gotta keep going. There's a, uh, I can remember when I was interviewing uh, for this job, actually, back in the past, some of the different folks that came around to interview me, they asked me this question. They said, hey, we've seen God use groups of people, they were referencing churches, groups of people to do phenomenal, encouraging, and amazing things to where if you're a follower of Christian, just picture and imagine, name whatever church that when you're bored, you podcast, whatever group of people that you've heard of due to their righteous influence, God is using to saturate and care for the community. And they said, hey, we've seen those. That's what we want to be. We got a desire to go there. And man, their humility was beautiful. Humility was beautiful. They just said, but we don't know how to get there. Have you ever seen lives where you've been amazed, where you've been spurred on, where you've seen, that's the type of abundant joy that I read about. That's the type of faithfulness that I really want to have. That's the type of parent that I want to be. That's the type of dating relationship I want to have that honors Christ above my boyfriend, my girlfriend. You ever been around those folks and there's that like inspiring component to it? Behind every place, and there can be some confusions with this, if that's what you're thinking about. But behind, behind every place of, of faithful, righteous influence, there's a lonely discipline of falling in love with God through his word. There's a famous example in your Bible. There's this famous teacher. His name was Ezra. It describes him 
He says, hey, he set his heart to study the law, to do it, and then to teach it to others. Two-thirds of his ministry was private. Two-thirds of it was private. God wants to use you to be publicly influential. God wants to use you to be a beacon of actual love to your kids where they see that's real faith. God wants to use you in the way you date, the way you engage with other folks where people look at that and they say, that's not how people date, man. It's not how people date. God wants to use you to where your marriage, people look at that and they say, man, they're not perfect, but I tell you what, they've got a joy. They don't just live together, they love each other. God wants to use you to be the beacon of hope. Just proclaiming to the world, Jesus Christ has come. He set me free. And he loves you in the same way he loves me. You don't have to do anything for it. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You just got to believe. And behind those people, there's a lonely discipline. I don't mean lonely and there's not a connection to a God in heaven as you meet with him in private. But what I mean is it is you and his him. Church, he's called us to be those people. He's called us to love him. I've never met someone who has a deep love for Jesus Christ, deep love that is not an active student of his word. I have never met someone that is emotionally mature in their Christian response to emotions that is not an active disciple and follower of his word. Man, may we be those people. And then watch what God does as he just sets you up. Why? Because people, they won't read the book, but they will read you. And God loves them and he loves you and he's written you a divine romance story and he just says, man, meet with me. If you are confused at all on how to do that, if today was too much, man, please don't leave without saying, hey, how do I start? Where do I go? How do I get to know? Let me pray that we do that and we'll get out of here. Father, I thank you for this group of people. I just thank you that they have a heart to come and say, Lord, we want to be yours. God, I'm asking in my life that I would love your word. You, you, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you with my whole heart. I seek you, but God, it's not true. It's not my whole heart. It is aspirational and not actual in my life. It is aspirational and not actual in ours. God, would you help us to love you more? Would you help us to be people of the word? Man, it's because there we meet a living God who sent us on Jesus and Jesus is everything. So I thank you for this time. Would you change lives? Would you do what only you can do? We love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You guys, thank y'all for coming. Love being with you. You guys go now being people of the word and have a great week of worship.